So this is going to be a little bit different this morning. When I started this sermon um, about dreams, I'll be honest with you, it was Steven Tyler that was in my head. <laughs> Some of you on Facebook when I posted made sure to share that and a couple others have shared it with me. Um, but by the time I finished, it wasn't Steven Tyler in my head on Dream On, it was Elvis, if I can dream, by the time I finished. We're not fixing to sing, it's just, it's okay. Um, oh, uh, preaching is, is funny. Um, it, it happens differently. Um, it, it just does. This week, is I'm going to be sitting in this shul. Um, why am I saying um so much? Yesterday, Tuesday, I was out walking, which you should never do. <laughs> I was walking in the neighborhood, and this, like, 52-foot <laughs> copperhead attacked me. And I fell. And I tore, pulled Achilles. It's not, it's not horrible, but it, it hurts. And so yesterday, even though Jen told me not to, I did. I, we went walking, Silver Comet Trail, and I heard it again. And so here I'm sitting. But, you know, we, we get done, and we get to the car. We're getting to the car, and I, I looked at Jen, and because in my, in my head, the sermon was pretty much, and I looked at Jen, I said, the sermon tomorrow is going to be really good. I, I think you're going to like it. And without missing a beat, she has just finished running three miles without, just, without even dropping her head. She looked dead at me and went, awesome, who's preaching? <laughs> That's your buddy. <laughs> um, so I'm going to preach two sermons this morning. Same amount of time. We're going to still get out of here at 12.05. Same amount of time, but it's, it is two sermons. Uh, the first sermon is for Smyrna First folks who've been here a long time, or, or been here a while, um, and who are quite wondering about the denominational stuff. Everybody with me? The first sermon is, that's for you. The second sermon is for folks who are new, folks who have just started coming, maybe even new and joining, but are very, very recent here. It's going to be two sermons today. For those of you who are a part of that first sermon, you still can't leave. <laughs> you still got to stay for the second sermon. But, but what I want you to hear is you're, you're going you're gonna, to, a lot of the stuff that you're going to hear in that second sermon, you're going to have heard before. And it's gonna, you're going to remember it. And so it's important. But this first sermon is, is this one. Um, all preaching is scripture based. Not everything, however, that comes from a pulpit is preaching. There's plenty of public speaking from a pulpit that is not preaching. When preachers stand up and preach the merit of politics, no matter the bent, it subjugates the gospel. In present-day United Methodism, we must be careful to not let our political or social opinions direct our Christian behavior. When we do, we risk being rooted in activism rather than scriptural truth. I want to have difficult conversations. I want our church family to be able to have differences without division. I pray for our denominational leaders pretty much every day to lead everyone, not just the ones they agree with or the ones that agree with them. So just a moment about general conference. Remember, this is for those who are United Methodists. If you're new and don't know this, consider yourself blessed. Um, let me give you an example. And some of you are about to have the most joy and worship you've ever had. Some of you are about to experience more joy and worship than you have ever experienced. Let's say 85% of the University of Georgia fans here left the church. Let's say 85% of the Georgia people left. Do we think the Tech fans on that next day would go, you know, we really ought to do something to make sure those remaining Georgia fans still feel comfortable here. We really need to figure out a way to make sure all those Georgia fans still bark at us as they walk past, and all those Georgia fans still feel welcome as a part of this community. Do we think Tech fans would do that? Nope. <laughs> Georgia fans wouldn't do it either. And if we walked over into Alabama and Auburn and had a conversation over there, hang it up. 
But do you know as Christians, that is exactly what the modern United Methodist and traditional United Methodist should do? We should make room for one another across the connection, across the room, across the pew, across this classroom. We should make room for one another. If for no other reason, it's what Jesus would do. Amen? All right, there's the first sermon. To the new members and our new folks and folks who've just joined and considering joining and for the folks who just showed up, we're going to talk about dreams. Dreams. Do you remember during COVID the crazy dreams that you'd have? Were you, were you one of those folks like the majority of us who just during COVID had these crazy dreams, especially as the world was completely shut down and our worlds were completely changed? We would have these crazy, crazy dreams. Jen and I would get up in the morning and we'd look at each other and go, well, how bad was your dream? And, and just, just nonstop, these, these dreams that were just so vivid and, and so painful and so stressful. And, the, and scientists let us know pretty quickly the reason that our dreams were so bad was because many of us were losing our dreams during the day. We were losing our dreams of things that we had always cared about and focused on, and our dreams were becoming so, so lost. Brendan, that first year, was a freshman at Georgia, the holy city. You, you knew I was going to come back for us there for a second. <laughs> he was a freshman there, and he had gone to school and worked and to get to school and he had to come home. Lost dream and stress and pain. The number of young couples and older couples who had been dreaming of a wedding, the number of families who had been looking forward to that wedding and been looking forward to that moment. We've got a church family that had opened restaurants in downtown Atlanta that lost all of it. The dreams that were just all of a sudden decimated in businesses and families and schools across the world. And so what they said was it was showing up in our dreams because it was in our psyche and it was causing even higher and higher stress, people losing their dreams. After a particularly troubling dream one morning, um, I got up really early and I went to my daily habit of reading the book of Psalms. It's not normally my morning devotion, but that morning it was. And I went to the Psalms, and you're, you're still in the United Methodist Church. I went to the Psalms because I believe God to be a speaking God. I believe that God speaks to us and that God speaks to us through our dreams and God cares about us and wants to comfort us when we're hurting and God speaks to us through visions and dreams and the Psalms are a great place to go to experience that. And and so part of where I, I start walking us into this conversation about your dreams is so much about our attitudes and our spiritual and emotional well-being is directly related to the attention we pay to our dreams the focus that we have for the dreams that we have of our life, so much of our interaction with the world is directly related to the attention that we pay to our dreams. And not just the dreams at night, but the dreams that you've had since you were a little kid. The dreams that have, that have defined you as an adult. The dreams of what help you get up in the morning. The dreams that help hold you together. How we pay attention to those and think about those are defining to us as as humans. And so on that morning, it was in January of 2021, on that morning where I've just had this horrible dream, the psalm that day was Psalm 121. And it's, it's this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. I can tell you where I was sitting when I was reading it. And I finished reading it and I had this one emotion just wash over me. Anger. What do you mean, God, you'll set my foot? What do you mean, God, you'll provide? What do you mean, God, you're looking out for me? What does the scripture mean that God's going to be protecting me and guiding me? It made me angry because I felt so lost. 
I, I felt so afraid. I felt so scared. I felt like such a failure. I, I felt so alone. Watching It's a Wonderful Life that year destroyed me. Because for the first time as an adult, I really watched him feel alone. And I cried all the way through it. All the way through it. And, and so in that, in that January day, as I'm reading this song, I'm going, I don't feel this. And it makes me angry because I want to know where God is. And so the very first step for us here as we start talking about prayer is that when you read Scripture, you have to be honest with the Scripture. You have to be authentic with the Scripture. Because if you try to hide how you're feeling and how you're experiencing and what you're thinking about the Scripture and what the Scripture is saying to you, God won't be able to speak to you in that moment. Now, let me also tell you the scary part. You can't hide from God. God already knows how you feel. God already knows what you're thinking. So be honest with him. And in that moment, I began to really dig in. And for those of you who've known me since then and have watched me change, and I've changed a lot, it was in that moment where the change started. It was in that moment where growth started. And so for four days, I'm wrestling with that text. For four days, I'm struggling with that text. For four days, that text is working me. And on that fourth night, I had the worst dream I've ever had. Ever. I woke up crying. And so on day five, I read this text, Psalm 126, 1 through 3. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream, that our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy, that it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. And, and, and what broke me down in that text was, do we have to be succeeding does the ministry have to be vibrant? Does it have to be great for me to rejoice in God? Does God have to pour blessings upon me for me to call him righteous? Does it have to be good around me? Does it have to be successful? Does it have to be great for me to be grateful and to be crying out in joy for God? And if it does, then what good is it? So in that moment, I began to pray and I began to dig in instead of, instead of God trying to figure out vitality, God, help me be faithful. God, where is it that you want me? God, where is it that I can be pouring in? God, where is it that you can be pouring into me? God, I want to rejoice before you bless. I don't want my rejoicing to be dependent upon blessing. And so we began to dig into that. And one of the places that we can, remember, this is January of 2021. One of the places that we really dug into was looking around. And remember, you've been gone for almost a year. And so the outside looked rough. You remember? And so over in the corner over here, it had overgrown. And in the, this space over here that we call the green space right now, it had gotten really rough. And so what we decided to do is we were going to start pulling weeds. We were going to start cleaning up. We were going to start fixing up. We were going to, didn't know what was going to happen with it, but we were going to start working because we wanted to create space that was going to please God. We wanted to do things that were going to please God. We wanted to, we wanted to do ministry. We wanted to do work that was going to be pleasing to God. And as we worked through it, there was a day that I, we were out there pulling weeds, and evidently I fall down. Because if you look at it, over in the corner is me laying on the ground, because I've been pulling weeds and I have fallen. And what you can't see is about eight people behind Shiloa in the orange dying laughing at me like I can't see them laughing at me. Well, and so we began to work and began to focus. And that wasn't the only area, but we began to pour in to say, where can we be pleasing to God? Where can we be blessing to God? Where can we be celebrating God without waiting on blessing? And so this picture was taken from that same spot three years later. From the very same spot as that first picture, this is the picture. Now, The blessing is not the children. I love the kids. I love those children. And Lord knows I've bled enough throughout this community to make sure we got this space. Hear me. The blessing is in faithfulness to Jesus. Because I'm not waiting on the blessing for the commitment. I'm not waiting on the blessing for me to be cry out joy for Jesus. The ministry is found in committing first and following God no matter what and depending upon him to provide the blessing. And so in that moment, we really began to dig in. In that moment, we really began to say, all right, what is it that God wants? 
What's going to please God? And, and it, was in, it was in that scripture for the first time I began to say this. And you've heard me say it now. For those of you that first sermon, second sermon, second sermon, you're hearing this for the first time, I began to use this phrase, what do the scriptures say? And that's where it developed for me. That's where it came for me. What do the scriptures say? So it was focusing on vitality, not vitality, focusing on commitment to Christ and focusing on and pouring into God and God pouring into us. And so I want to convince you this morning, for those of you who are new, keep dreaming. You may feel absolutely lost and you may have lost stuff in COVID. You may have lost stuff in relationships. You may have lost stuff. Keep dreaming. But don't be dreaming for the vitality. Be dreaming for the faithfulness that you've got a connection to God, that you can continue to pour into God, that God continues to pour into you, and in that relationship, you get the real blessing. If you've quit dreaming, I want you to start again. One of the, one of the, the quotes was from Dr. Howard Thurman back then, a dream is the bearer of a new possibility, the enlarged horizon, the great hope. If it doesn't enlarge your horizon, if the dream does not make your horizon larger and doesn't give you hope, it's not worth it. Families, here's an example. If your dream for church is so that your kids will quit being just a little bit less obnoxious, if your dream for church is that your kids will act just a little bit better when you go out to eat or just a little bit better at school, that's not a worthy dream. If your dream is at church and in their religious community that they learn how to listen to Jesus, and learn how when they watch movies, when they read books, when they watch TV shows, when they have conversations, to hear and to see and to experience Jesus and the Holy Spirit and everything that they do and in everywhere they go, that God walks with them and Jesus walks with them and that changes who they are. Now you're in a, now you're in a God-sized dream, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Now you're in a dream that's worthwhile. And so we, we dig into these conversations. We dig into having dreams that are worthwhile. So, so this morning, how can you know if you've lost your dreams? When you're spending too much time on the way things used to be, you're losing your dreams. When you spend too much time focusing on, when we spend too much time focusing on what it used to be, we're losing our dreams. This one hurts, okay? Hurt me before it hurts you. When our memories exceed our dreams, the end is near. When our memories exceed our dreams, the end is near. And even if we're hurting, faith does not present us, prevent us from experiencing emotional or physical fatigue. It does give us a place to set down the fatigue, to set down the hurt. Dreams that are God dreams, when we are listening to God, when we are pouring into God, those dreams give us a place to set down the fatigue, to set down the hurt, to set down the worry to set down the anxiety, because if this is about me being faithful to God and let God handle the dream, then I don't have to live in that worry. And my dreams in that moment started to clean up. And I don't just mean the dreams during the day, I mean the dreams during the night, because something began to change in me and happen to me, and I began to realize this is God's, not yours. And so what I want you to hear from me today is if you've got stress that's racking you, you can't fix the things that are racking you. You can give them to God and ask God what is the dream that he wants you to live out. You are not weak if you are weary. You are not weak if you are tired. You are not weak if you are discouraged. You are not weak if you are at your wit's end. You are at the beginning of an opportunity to lay your weary, your tired, your discouragement, and your afraid wits at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I give all this to you. Let me say it again. Faith does not prevent us from experiencing emotional or physical fatigue. It does give us a place to set down the fatigue. The pandemic saw preachers and church staff step away from church at record numbers. Not just United Methodists, not just Smyrna, but churches. And the reason that they were stepping away was because it was so hard to see a future. There was so much loss, so much pain, you couldn't step out of that. I quit every day for a season. I was ready to, I was Googling rutabaga farms. I was ready to go start a rutabaga farm. I was ready. The only reason I'm still here is because every morning I got up and did it again. It's hard. And the reason is, is because spending too much time looking back and not looking forward. 
When you hire church staff, one of the greatest things to do and one of the biggest blessings is to hire staff that's going to come in with energy. And the higher staff that's going to come in ready to take on the world, ready to change the world, that believes in the gospel, that believes in Jesus Christ, and they come on ready to shake things up. And we, we obviously had some of that, and, and we'll have more coming. Um, the worst staff member you can hire is the one who tells you how great it was at their former church. Oh, that's exhausting. They tell you how wonderful it was. They tell you how amazing it was. Oh, at this church. And we had somebody on staff that did that. We had someone on staff that all they talked about in every room they walked into was how great their former church was. You know who it was? <laughs> and I wasn't talking about Villarica or any other one because I would tell the staff, oh, when we had 1,100 people in worship every week. Oh, when these hallways were full of Sunday school classes. Oh, when the ministry was so great here, it was so wonderful. Will we ever get back to it? It was me. And to be able to start visioning and dreaming again, I had to let go of the past to get to the future. As long as I sat in that past and sat in that hurt, I was not allowing God to start preparing me for that future. And the pain and the hurt, I know you feel it. It's there. But there is no future in the past. Jesus himself got tired. In John 4, 6, John tells us that Jesus was tired and he went to the well, to Jacob's well. And Jesus not only wants water, but he's wanting wisdom. And, and Jacob's well is a place of wisdom. Jacob's well is a place that you go to, to, to hear from God, to speak to God. And in that moment at the well, he has the conversation with the woman who starts to question him and push back on him on the church. And when he, when he tries to tell her who he is, she says, I don't want to hear about this church stuff. Y'all can't quit arguing today. One of you says church is here. One of you says it's here. One of you says this. all y'all do is fight and argue. Does it sound familiar? All y'all do is argue. And in that moment, Jesus, who is tired, the scripture says, begins to tell her who he is. For those who worship in spirit and truth, they'll get it. For those that understand that I came into the world not to judge it, but to save it. For those that really pay attention and give their life to me, you'll never be thirsty again. It's in that moment that he who is tired from his own purpose, from his own dream, is able to explain key to life. Give your life to Jesus. So let me ask you, raise your hand. Anybody here think Jesus is weak? And yet he was tired. But it was in that purpose of who he was and the purpose of what God called him to do, called him to be, that brought the healing. So you fast forward from January 2021 to May 2021, and um, we're starting to... I get, I get strength from two places. One is from Jen and the boys. The, the staff and the clergy know if I've gone too far from sitting at a table with them and, and, and making fun of them and them making fun of me and us laughing and having that time, I'm not fun to be around. I'm not saying I'm always fun to be around anyway, but I'm really not good to be around in that moment because I, they are my, they are my, my cornerstone and, and family. The other one is staff. I enjoy sitting with staff. I enjoy sitting with clergy and dreaming and planning and digging in and working in. And so now that this is over here happening in the green space, we're sitting down as a staff and saying, okay, we have no children's ministry. Do you hear me? We, re we really have no children's ministry. I think we were sitting at like 10 or 11 families. Youth ministry is even worse. We're a mess. What do we do? And so we started talking about pathways of how to pour into kids, of how to pour into children's and children's families and all the way through in a journey manner worthy of God. And the first thing we said was, is we can get the kids in here. The preschool is starting to rebuild. Weekdays, we believe this is going to happen, but we got to make sure we don't lose them from children's ministry to youth ministry. And Club 4-5 returned. And Club 4-5 returned as a way of pouring into the kids. And Jordan and Esty and the staff at that point dug in and said, let's go. At that point, the discipleship committee with Sherry Vining started to really take root and really get going and, and energy really occurring and really taking off. And then the conversation was, well, how do we make sure we don't lose them from children's ministry to youth ministry? Confirmation. 
And at that point, we were sitting on like four or five kids, even close to that age group. And we poured in and said, we're not going to focus on the blessing of the kids. We're going to focus on the blessing of trusting God. We're going to focus on the blessing of digging in and focusing on what's going to please God. And so this past year, we spent just a little bit shy of $70,000 on confirmation for these kids this year. And you know how much that came out of the church budget? Because of sponsors and because of folks in the community and church members who said, this matters and these kids are getting ready to walk into a very stressful world and we want to do everything we can to come alongside them and support them. Now, where did that conversation come from? In early May, the very first couple of days of May, I was reading Habakkuk, you know, as you do. I was reading Habakkuk 2 and 2, 3, and this came. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. It seems to tarry. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. The second piece of this is when you have dreams, write them down. And so as we're dreaming, we began to write them down. And many of you have seen these walls. We began to write them down. <laughs> and these were the walls that we began to write. And at the very middle of it, the very center of it, was where we began to talk about how we were going to pour into, how we were going to be blessing, and how we were going to be caring for kids. And at the center of this is confirmation. Club 4-5, children's ministry, youth ministry, and discipleship. We wrote it down and then worked the plan. We wrote it down, shared it with one another, and dug in. Now, if you're new and you're sitting there going, why is this new? We weren't part of that. I'm getting to it, but I want to make sure you understand this. We wrote it down, not because of some book, but because of the book. Habakkuk says, write it down. So how can you keep your dreams? Write your things down. Write your dream down. Dream forward, not backwards. Dream forward, not backwards. Nothing is more depressing than backwards dreams. In the next couple of months, $2 million is going to walk in here. I'm going very, very slow right now intentionally. Over the next couple of months, $2 million is going to walk in here. We cannot spend any of those $2 million trying to figure out the past or to restore dreams from the past. It will become a curse, not a blessing. Dreams are future forward focused. And just like the green space and just like the children's ministry and the youth ministry and confirmation is growing, focused on the forward, every penny from your leadership, through your leadership, through you, through prayers, through dreaming, through conversation, should be focused on how can we love the people around us best? How can we share the love of God, the love of Jesus, most powerfully, most effectively, most lovingly, most courageously? How can we do that? It is not ever looking back. It is always looking forward. And the third piece is this. Dream big dreams. Don't settle for small dreams. We should not be trying to figure out how can we get just a couple more people in a Sunday school class? How can we get a couple more folks in worship? We should not be thinking small. We should be dreaming big. How can we bring transformation to Smyrna, Georgia? How can we church Smyrna? How can we love people in a way that changes lives? How can we make sure there's never a kid that goes hungry again? How can we make sure that people, that they're sitting, no matter where they're sitting, that they know that God loves them and we do too? We should be dreaming big. We should be focusing big and on forward and on where we're going and on where God wants us to be. Dream big. Paul said it like this in Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it. But one thing I have laid off, hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had some amazing stuff behind him. If, if you just sit here and think about Paul for a second, he had some amazing ministry behind him. He had some pretty horrible stuff behind him as well. I mean, the death of Stephen, 
He had some pretty horrible stuff. He was on his way to go kill people, kill Christians, some horrible stuff behind him as well. And he didn't let either one hold him back. You've got some amazing stuff behind you. And I'm not just talking about church right now. You've got some amazing stuff behind you in your life. You've got some pretty horrible stuff behind you too. Don't let either one hold you back. What God has before us is more beautiful and wonderful and amazing than anything in the past. My dream, more Jesus, less religion. Now that's sermons for both of you. More Jesus, less religion. The joy is that we serve a God big enough under a tent wide enough to hold all of our different opinions. The joy is that we serve a God big enough under a tent wide enough that holds all of our different thoughts and worldviews. Today, we get to walk out of here as children of God with only three pieces of homework. First one is this. What are you dreaming about? What dreams have you lost? What dreams are you still trying to figure out? And write them down. Write them down. Before I do the next two, I want to say this to you. The reason I'm doing two sermons today is I'm getting a lot of questions from new people right now. A lot. Some of which are walking into our confirmation ministry about who are you? And what am I plugging into? What am I getting connected to? And, and, and what, am I, what, what am I walking my family into? Because I'm hearing a lot of stuff about United Methodists right now. I'm not preaching this just because I want to. I'm preaching this because a lot of folks are walking in the church right now and asking, who are you? And I'm telling you, we are people who dream big dreams. And if you're walking in new right now, you know how many more times you're going to hear about the last two years? Never. Ever. You know what you're going to hear about the last 20 years? Unless you're sitting in a room with Linda Porter, not a word. <laughs> or David Martin. We are future focused. And if you're looking for a place to, to join in, if you're looking for a place to plug your family in, to dream big dreams, well, are you ready to love the person in front of you? Because that's the second piece of homework. And I'm going to change it a little bit, not just love the person in front of you, love the person you're in front of. Jen and I watch Band of Brothers every year. We finished last night, around Memorial Day. And I was reminded of something that they say when you ask the soldiers how they were able to get off that boat, how they were able to storm the beach. And they never said, we did it for God. They never said, we did it for country. Do you remember what they said they did it for? The person next to me. I was able to keep moving forward because I didn't want to disappoint the person next to me. Love the person in front of you. Love the person you're in front of. Love the person you're next to. And if you can keep Jesus as your first love, if you can keep Jesus as your first love, welcome home. Welcome home where your church. Go home, write down your dreams, Love the person in front of you and keep Jesus as your first love. And try not to go walking. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.